You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the options playbook the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody. That music means it's that time again. It is time once again for Options Playbook Radio, the program where we break down all of the fascinating options plays that you can utilize in your own portfolio. Maybe we want to go on offense, a little bit of income, a little bit of speculation. We got you covered these days, <laughs> given what's going on in the market. Maybe you want to play a little more defense. Don't worry. We got you covered there as well. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, on the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. And if you're saying to yourself, self, what is that guy doing on this show? That's not his show. You are correct. So let me toss it over to your regularly scheduled co-host, a.k.a. The Options Guy himself. Mr. Brian Overby, the senior options analyst over there at Ally Invest. Mr. Brian, welcome back to your own show, sir. Well, that's great, Mark, and what a wonderful introduction. And I'm always happy when you can give an introduction uh, as wonderful as that one is, because that means that we get to answer some listener questions. And uh, they've really been flooding in recently, from what I heard. So we almost have to do, maybe have to do an extra one or two on this session. But uh, whenever we get a chance to get together, that means that we're going to huddle up and answer some of these questions. The Huddle. It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via questions at theoptionsinsider.com, twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via the Trader Network at tradeking.com. All right, everybody. Time to huddle up. That's where Brian and I answer your questions. And Brian, you are correct, sir. I don't know if something's in the water, if we just inspired people with our last huddle episode or or what it is. But we usually get a strong response to the show. But the last week, week and a half, it's been off the charts. People are really responding with a, a wide array of questions on a wide array of topics. So, Brian, you opened the floodgates. I don't know what you did, Brian. But uh, people, <laughs> people are the floodgates are open and they are flooding through. Let's see. How many we can get. Let's start it off. Let's make it nice and easy. Let's start off with this one from Eric. Eric Norstedt. And if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I do apologize. Let's see here. He writes, Options Insider. Well, hello. (laughs) He says, I just listened to the OPR. See, look, Brian, OPR, episode 272. What did I tell you? All the cool kids, they call it OPR now. You got got to get down with the system there, sir. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, let's get to it. He says, I just listened to the OPR 272 episode, and I had a question. When you say you want to, quote, do the entire trade at the midpoint for even, what exactly do you mean, thanks? And by the way, 
the 272 episode, Brian, just to refresh your memory, was your recent episode you just did on a little bit of beerish downside on Uber, just to refresh your memory. So when you want to do the whole thing at the midpoint for even, what are you talking about, Brian? All right. Well, uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about the midpoint, um, especially when you're doing spreads, which, which is more commonly what we talk about here on Options Playbook Radio. Uh, that means you got at least two legs or more in your options strategy. And when you do that, you, in order to figure out the bid and the ask, you've got to do a little bit of math. And the, we like to call it actually the net mid or the net bid or the net ask because you're dealing with two or more options. So uh, the midpoint in general is the midpoint between the bid and the ask. And when you're talking about spreads, especially in underlyings where the market can get a little bit wide, um, example would be a great example is the S&P 500 index. Uh, it's such a high-priced index that a lot of times you'll see artificially wide uh, quotes inside on particular option contracts. So when we look at that, uh, a lot of people, j- just to get a reference point, like to talk about the midpoint, and we then that gives you a, a, a placing. You're not leaning towards the ask. You're not leaning towards the, mi- the bid. You're just at the midpoint. So if we get a midpoint fill for even, that's another term that is used in order entry, that means we're just doing it for zero. And on the Uber trade that we were looking at, we were selling a credit spread to pay for a out-of-the-money, basically, lottery ticket. So we sold a call credit spread on the upside to help pay for a way out-of-the-money put on the downside uh, around earnings. And the whole goal was that we would get it done, and it would not cost us anything but commissions. And getting it done for zero means that we're getting it done for even. And all order entry tickets don't have the ability to actually enter the word zero or the number zero as the limit price. They usually have a radio button or an ability to actually enter that trade at even. So that's where the vernacular comes from. So we were looking to do a three-legged trade last week, and we were hoping to execute the entire trade at the midpoint for even, and that would have been a great fill on that trade. Well said. So Eric, I hope that clarifies things for you. Again, a lot of times when when Brian's doing these episodes, it's after hours, markets are a little wide. So even is a nice, and certainly midpoint are, are nice safe places to help try to execute your trades. Again, it's more about the strategy and explaining exactly what the intention is and how you can utilize it rather than the exact price. And a lot of you guys get hung up. We had questions last time too about the exact price. Was it a 32 cent debit? Was it a 35 cent credit? That's not the exact spirit of it. We're really trying to more explain to you how you can utilize these. And again, a couple cents here or there, but worth noting midpoint Always a good place to start when you're analyzing and looking to execute your trade. All right, Brian, we can't start. we got to keep rolling. All right, um, next up. Look, we've got some great listener names on the show, too. They, they come from all over, and they have great, great spellings. <laughs> it can't just be a John Smith, Brian. It's got to be epic ones, which makes it more fun, more challenging for me to read all these. Uh, but let's see. Next up, we have Welch. Just an easy one, though. Welch Kwong. And he wants, to, he wants to know about risk-free trades through rolling credit spreads out and up or down. He says, good afternoon, Brian. Well, Welch is very, very, uh, very polite. I like it. He says, a huge fan of your weekly podcast. I've asked a question before, and you guys were extremely helpful for your response and expertise. Well, glad to hear that, Welch. Uh, he keeps going on. I have another question, wondering if you can help. He says, risk-free credit spreads. Let's say the infamous underlying XYZ, yes, very infamous, is at $50 on a Monday. And I sell a 60, 65 call spread at approximately $1 expiring in five days, so on that Friday. I get a $1 credit. My risk is $4 potential max loss per spread. Yes. He goes on to write, if I continue to roll a position out for a credit, rolling up, I don't think really matters for this question, but with enough rolling and credits to add up to $5, <laughs> would that mean that the overall trade was at zero risk, not taking into account commissions? Uh, before I exp- before expiration Friday, I roll out a week for another credit, fifty cent credits, and I was adding up to a buck fifty. He says, "Repeat, repeat, week after week, sixty cents, etc., forty five cents, all the way up to five dollars as a total credit received on the trade." He says, "Does that make the five dollar wide credit call spread essentially risk free, whether it expires in the money or out of the money?" As always, thank you for your help. 
Welch. Well, and I, Brian, I always get nervous when I see things like a subject line of risk-free credit spreads because that always that's a big red flag for me. <laughs> I know that area is uh, a lot of scammers like to use the notion of credit spreads to entice people to the dark side. Whenever I see risk-free, it makes me very nervous. But I think his concept here is pretty straightforward. He puts on the spread and eventually he rolls it enough times that he has enough credits to cover the risk. And now, is that effectively a risk-free trade? I guess that kind of depends on your perspective, right? Because if he, if he doesn't want to lose that $5, <laughs> then no, it's not risk-free because you can lose that $5, right? But effectively, he has generated enough to offset it. So I guess if the worst would come to pass, he would be even on the trade. So I guess, Brian, it's a very, it's a very subjective question. Where, where do you fall on this risk-free credit spread idea? Well, the... The biggest thing to understand when you're rolling something, I don't care if it's a covered call um, or if it's a credit spread, every time you roll, you're usually rolling because you're behind on the trade, because you're losing on the trade. So once you roll and you close the current position in your account, you're locking in a loss. So you need to pay attention to how much that loss is just over time. Like one time it might be 25 cents, the next time it might be 50 cents. But overall, you need to realize that you are locking in that loss. And so in order to get ahead of the game, one of those credit spreads really needs to expire worthless. In other words, you've got to be right at least once over this three or four times that you're doing this trade, or you have all that risk. Because what you've done is you've locked in a loss when you rolled, and now you, got, you could lose the max loss on the next credit spread. So if that was five points wide, I would have lost on the first trade, and now I'm going to have the potential to lose on the second trade. So keep in mind that when you're rolling, just because you're bringing in a credit, it doesn't mean that this is a profitable thing to do in the options world. And what this kind of reminds me of, and it just reminds me of being like at a blackjack table where everybody thinks that they can figure out the game because if you bet and you lose, all you have to do is keep doubling your bet until you eventually win. And that concept can work if you don't run out of money, if you have unlimited money, so you just keep... But the, still, the whole point is there that if I'm at the blackjack t- table and I lose four in a row and I keep doubling, first of all, I'm going to be putting up a lot of cash. Second of all, I'm hoping that they'll take my bet when I get down to the end of it because casinos get a little finicky when it gets a little bit bigger. And then bottom, I don't know how I know that, but with that being said, bottom line is I still have to have a winner to really make this trade profitable. And so I guess the moral to my story is is to really, if you're looking at doing this type of trade, yeah, I guess it is feasible, but usually when it's all said and done, you need to understand that every time you roll, you are legitly locking in a loss on that initial position. Yeah, I think he's assuming that if he keeps doing it, it goes out worthless, so he sold it for a buck, he keeps the buck, and he does it again the next week. Maybe he kind of mixed his metaphors a little bit. A little bit. But the way we get asked this question a lot, Brian, is people have a cheap stock. Let's say it's an $8 stock, and they're writing... 50 cent covered calls on it here or there. I mean, and eventually they, they add up enough credits that they get the stock quote unquote for free, right? That, that's how they see it. Mm-hmm. I think, I think Welch here is on a similar trajectory where he's like, if I get, if I sell enough, <laughs> if I sell enough, yeah. that eventually it comes again. So he technically is correct, but I guess it depends on, you know, your definition of free, right? If you made all that money, you made five bucks. Do you want to give it away? <laughs> I guess it, it, then, it, right. then, then it's not really risk free, is it? So I guess it's, that's why I said it's kind of subjective. And maybe Welch, He's a high roller. Right, but risk but means the risk is to still on the table, though, too, right? So if he rolls and he rolls that final one, he makes that five bucks, he could still lose on that last trade, right? Exactly. He could lose all that five bucks he made. So I think he's, right. seeing, he's seeing it from a net profit perspective. But yeah, the risk is still there. The risk is, right. the risk is unchanged. Your, your perspective on that risk has changed a bit. <laughs> right. Because you're sitting on right. some house and, money. And I, and I also think, I think this is just such a great question, though. I, I, I really do believe that a lot of beginning option traders, especially people, and you're right, this is more so in the cover call world, where they just think that if I'm bringing in a net credit on any of these roles, that I'm not losing any money. And, you know, that's a major flaw. You, all of a sudden, your account just starts going down. You don't quite understand why. But it's, if, if you just keep rolling and you have to keep rolling, every time you roll, you're, you're, you're setting in a net loss. So if the market tanks on you, on a, uh, like, say, the stock goes down on a covered call position, you know, you lost on that last position and you're still losing on the stock. So the risk is still out there because you have that position on. All right. You mentioned beginner options trades. It's a great 
segue into our next question here. We got a couple of related questions, uh, so let's get to both of them together. First off, Bob Randall, he says, Brian, I have a 12-year-old niece with a very bright mathematical mind that I am trying to get into options. I'm looking for either beginning games or age-appropriate books or videos to teach her about options. I discussed this with my mentor, but he was not aware of any. I also have two editions of the playbook. I thought I might reach out to you for any suggestions. Uh, he says his niece, his niece has been selected into a math academy. He goes on about the school district and things. He says but math skills and statistics and probability will be among the classes she will take, along with calculus and other advanced math classes. Well, that's a lot to take at 12. But she and I would like to get an early start on the options world. Any suggestions Guidance or thoughts? Thanks, Bob, from San Diego. And uh, we had a related question here, a shorter one, but more to the point here from Stephen. Stephen Patel wants to know, do I need to be a math whiz to understand this option stuff? Uh, So uh, interesting. A couple of different approaches to this. It sounds like Bob's niece is, is very advanced on the mathematical side. So certainly it might make her more inclined to want to lead towards the derivatives route. I mean, the big D is in the name after all, so it does make them sound a little bit more maybe enticing to someone who's more mathematically inclined, but maybe Stephen doesn't sound like he is. It sounds like he's on the opposite side of the spectrum, and he's maybe a little bit intimidated by the mathematical requirements for options. So, so Brian, set the table straight here for both Stephen and Bob on behalf of his niece here. What do you really need to know about options, or should we, what do you need to know about math to really trade options effectively? And what, maybe for, as a special segue here for Bob and his niece, do you have any suggestions to help her get going on the, uh, on the mathematical side of options at an early age? Well, I think that the, as far as the math is concerned, um, especially from a retail perspective, I think it matters more that you just have a general grasp of option pricing and the math background that's behind it. Um, I do a webinar about option pricing, and I basically talk about how options are priced very similar to insurance products. And the math and all the variables that are in it, even the mathematical models. At one point in time, I was thinking about becoming an actuary, actually. Um, but then I definitely laid down until that urge went away. Uh, there were, I think, 10 tests overall to become a full-blown actuary that are, get really deep into statistics. And my whole point is I didn't take all those those tests because when you're looking at the options world, you just have to have a general concept of it. And I do think that beginning option traders make a mistake in that they don't learn a little bit more about how the options are priced, how that time component is in the price of an option contract, and how it's different than a stock. They just think that, in general, cheaper is better. So why not pay less for that option as opposed to paying more? And usually that means that you're buying out-of-the-money option contracts. So overall, I think you just really need a broad perspective on how options are priced. And in order to really understand that, you really need to know that options come more... Um, sorry, let's start that over. that options are actually priced more like insurance products than they are priced like equity or securities. And you need to understand that concept before you actually dive into even buying your first option contract. You need a general overview of it. Now, if I'm going in and I'm looking at uh, any uh, Maddie, I guess, was his 12-year-old's niece name from looking at the the document, Um, I, I don't know overall what I would uh, suggest as far as any games or any math uh, books overall to look at, but the biggest thing in the options world is statistics. So if you're going to understand any of the pricing models, you're going to understand any, uh, any deep mathematical books the side that you're going to lean on is math and understanding the fact that when I'm trading an option or I'm setting an options price, I'm just looking at the statistical probability of the underlying stock reaching a specific strike. So if you really want to become a deep 
uh, on the floor market trader that's trying to figure out volatility more than price and doing that. Well, then the, the math that you want to reach out for is all statistical. But when you really think about it as a retail trader, you should be worrying a little bit more about where that underlying stock is than all the mathematical models that are behind it. There is an old adage that, you know, what is, what's the cost of this option contract is what it's trading for right now. And I've had a lot of people even call up, and just a little anecdote to finish with here, I've just had so many people uh, from my days of answering phone calls, you know, way back on the desk, way when I was much younger, where I'd have a retail client call up and say, well, I looked at the Black Shoals pricing model on this IBM option contract, and it says that this option contract should be trading for $2.50, and I got a quote on it, and it says it's really trading for $3.00. Could you call up the floor and have them update the quote? <laughs> so, you know, it really comes down to the price is what the price is. You need to worry about the strategy and getting the timing right overall. But, yeah, I would just push people – I'd just push Maddie towards uh, statistics overall and statistics classes, and that's the, the best thing that I can do. But I don't know of a particular software that I could say or that, that would teach me option pricing just in general. Yeah, that's where the mathematics really comes into play, right? You mentioned the pricing models, you know, it could be the old, you know, deriving the old Black Shoals or Cox, Ross, Rubenstein. There's a bunch of different models out there, binomials, all sorts of different ways to price options. I think the good news for Steven is that you don't need to derive the Black Shoals model every time you make an options trade. I think if you have a basic understanding of algebra and indeed calculus, remember they are derivatives at the end of the day, so you have a, a basic understanding of how these derivatives work and how things like delta and gamma are impacted and vega and theta and all these fun things that we learn about in the Greeks and how they all work as a result of these various derivative equations. If you can at least wrap your head around that, then you're, you have a good starting point. Then from there, once you understand the concepts, you can trade and have a relatively firm grasp of the fundamentals. Now, it sounds like uh, Bob's niece, and by the way, congratulations, your niece, 12-year-old, interested in options. I wonder where she's getting that from, Bob. <laughs> My little guy's 10, and he, he, I live in the options world, and he has no interest. So clearly, you've been whispering in her ear there, uh, Bob. But yeah, you know, that early start, I think for her, it might be intriguing to start working once she understands, once she's taken these classes and understands, like Brian mentioned, statistics, obviously calculus, something. once she's taken those, it might be fun to sit down with her and, you know, everyone's definition of fun is different and it sounds like for her, uh, fun might be indeed, you know, deriving some of these formulas, understanding how things like Black Shoals work, maybe some of the, the problems with a formula like that, which is why we have things like Vega, which is kind of the universal fudge factor for all of the issues that go on in the world of uh, Black Shoals and maybe binomials and which ones are more accurate and things like that. So if she's into that, and of course, maybe some starter books on that front, the old, the old standby of, of Natenberg, Option Volatility and Pricing. I would hesitate, usually recommend that to a 12-year-old, but it uh, sounds like maybe she'd be interested in that. That could explain to her. That's, that's the tome that all market makers were handed when you first walked on the floor of the CBO. I said, here you go, welcome, you know, get your badge, here's your Options Volatility and Pricing. By uh, Natenberg. That one is kind of, she can get that, start to understand things like skew. That will make her probably more comfortable understanding these concepts and then eventually getting into the trading world at the, at the, at the bright young age of 12. So <laughs> uh, good luck to both of you. Bob, let us know how it works out. And Stephen, don't be scared by uh, the math out there. Brian, I'll leave it up to you. Do you want to do another epic one or maybe try to find a quick one to, to close it out? Up to you. Yeah, we, I think we got a quick one, right? We have been going for a while. <laughs> we have been going around. All right, let's see. Um, oh, here's a guy who sent in a quick question. I don't know if it's that quick, Brian. He wants to know, Charlie, Charlie C. wants to know, what is the weirdest thing you've seen in the options market, sir? So uh, there you go. What is, what is the weirdest thing in the breadth and scope? It's, it's a deceptively quick. Maybe it's a little longer than he thinks. <laughs> Uh, what is the weirdest thing I've seen in the options world? Huh. Well, if I'm thinking about just in general, I, I don't necessarily know like an odd trade or anything that, that happened um, in the options world that I could just think off of the top of my head. But one of the things that I think is even a hard thing for advanced traders to grasp is how volatility skew works in the options world. Like, uh, and I'll use the most simple example. If you're looking at, especially after a, uh, a big down day in the marketplace, if you look at the S&P 500 index, 
and you look at what the puts trade for, the equidistant out of the money to the out of the money call options, and you just see how much more those put options are, especially in indexes so like the SPX, which is used by a lot of institutional traders. Uh, they will really pay up for some protection in a big index like the S&P 500 index. And because of that, we call that volatility skew. Some people have called it tilt overall, but uh, it's just the way that you got to pay up for out-of-the-money puts for protection. And it just really comes from the fact that People, when people are scared and they panic, they'll run to that market and they're willing to pay whatever they can to try to protect themselves. And I think that that's probably the weirdest thing that I can come up with. I don't have a specific trade or a specific stock that went a little crazy, um, but I don't know. What about you, Mark? Yeah, that, that's a good place. I might piggyback off that, Brian, because you're right. I, I could think of a bunch of you know crazy things, a lot of dubious trades that went up when I first walked on the floor of the SIBO and a lot of maybe lessons I learned from seeing those. But I think your point about skew is a good one. And I saw this personified in my face <laughs> very in a very interesting fashion. You know, the old timers and everyone used to say, the risk managers used to say on the SIBO, you always have to have some bullets in your gun, which meant don't be short, naked, a bunch of downside because you never knew what might happen. You want to have those bullets to fire when you needed them. And I saw this play out in dramatic fashion back in the go-go days of the original dot-com boom. And Intel was one of the darlings of the street. And I was out there making markets in Intel. I'd moved from SPX to Intel. And they did a rare thing, which may be a sign of the canary in the coal mine. The bloom was starting to come off the tech rows. They pre-announced bad earnings. And it was a disaster. The stock was off just through the toilet before I even got off the floor. Before the, and by the time I got back the next day, and the more, it was only after hours, it was selling off dramatically. By the time I got back the next day, you always knew it was going to be a crazy day because there was a bunch of traders who didn't have much going on in their pits that day were gathered around our pit just to watch, just to watch the madness that was going to ensue. So you knew it was going to be a crazy day. The walk-in brokers were lined up all around the pit, ready to go with orders. Second, the bell opened. And in that moment, you could see exactly what they meant by, you know, have some bullets in the back of your gun. And also what Brian was talking about, with skew because guess what? The stock was tanking, and guess what? Every one of those orders was. They weren't looking to buy calls. Nope, they were looking to buy puts, and they wanted to know what your offer was on XYZ put, and they wanted to buy them. They wanted to buy all of them. And as the sell-off continued for a little bit, the, the bids increased, and then eventually the sell-off kind of petered out, and that's when the bids started to come in. And for a while there, you could sell puts if you had the bullets to sell, and I fortunately did. I had saved my, saved my bullets for that rainy day, and when it came, it was nice to fire them at extremely elevated levels of implied volatility, and that vol came crashing in the moment the sell-off mitigated. And by the end of the day, the vol was not quite normal, but pretty close to it again. And those levels you had sold earlier in the morning just seemed absurd by later on in the afternoon. So it was definitely uh, just a very stark reminder of how skew evolves, sometimes intraday, depending on how a crazy event plays out, and also maybe a little bit of risk management there as well. So uh, always, always keep those bullets in your chamber for days like that, or maybe days like today in the markets with the broad index off 3%. You want to have those bullets in the chamber ready to go. Well, Brian, we got more, but we got to kind of close it off there. Keep those questions coming, though. We'll have an, I, think, I got a feeling given the volume of your questions, that Brian and I are going to be doing this again real soon. So keep those questions coming. I promise we'll get to more of them soon. But Brian, if other folks want to join the party here, they want to be like Steven or Bob or Welch or Eric or all the rest of the crew here, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Well, they can send me an email directly at uh, my email address that I've set up specifically for the show. It's called the options guy at invest.ally.com. That's the options guy at invest.ally.com. And I want to say to everybody out there, thanks for listening and please keep your questions coming until the next time. We'll be back at the same time, same place next week. The options playbook is brought to you by ally invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or 
Search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.